Hey everyone, welcome to the 215th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have a stellar show for you today. We're going to be talking about Google I.O. We're also going to be talking about Google killing its works with Nest program, what that means for developers, the industry, and you, the consumer. We're also going to be talking about Amazon's new products, and how much its digital assistant, who we like to refer to as Madam A, knows. The answer will surprise you. All right. And after that, we've got another tech conference that was this week, Microsoft Build. On the industrial side, we have seen a lot of new announcements we're going to talk about. And we'll close out the show with a lot of little updates, such as an update on Bluetooth and a legal decision that could change how your apartment works. Plus, Everyone has asked us about how the Wise Sense system works, and we have a review for you. Our guest this week is going to be Kiva Allgood. She's the head of IoT and automotive at Ericsson. She just took that role after having roles at Qualcomm and at GE. She's kind of like this person who has followed the industrial IoT everywhere, and it's a really good interview. So stay tuned for that after a message from our new sponsor, Dell. Yay, Dell Technologies. And before we get to the show, let's hear from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Nordic Semiconductor. Nordic Semiconductor is the world-leading provider of ultra-low power wireless solutions. They have over 2 billion chips shipped to date, and you're probably no more than a few meters away from Nordic Technology. It's inside everything from watches, toys, coffee makers, keyboards, and game controllers, plus medical monitors, smart home products, and wireless mics. Nordic's chips are the brains and the voice behind all those everyday connected products you depend upon and love to use. They deliver multi-protocol devices and have a vast range of supporting software and tools to build amazing, cutting-edge wireless products with technology such as Bluetooth Low Energy, Zippy, Thread, NB-IoT, and LTEM. Their mission is to provide everything necessary for anyone to build amazing, secure, connectable products that perform at the absolute max of what is technologically possible. Nordic Semiconductor, helping you connect anything. Go to www.nordicsemi.com to find out more about Nordic Semiconductor. Okay, Kevin. What a week. I'm already tired and we haven't even started. And it's not just because I'm traveling. I'll let everyone know that I am recording this week from a hotel room. So any weirdness in the sound, that is my fault. And you can certainly send me emails telling me all about how you don't like it (laughs) or how you do like it, whichever. It won't change Uh, anything, but you can send those like emails. But (laughs) you can tell me how you feel about it. So let's talk about Google I.O. Because this week we had two big tech conferences, Google I.O. and Microsoft Build. And both are really important in our space. So we'll start with Google because... So because much. You, so much, yes. Because <laughs> there's so much. <laughs> yes. I actually watched the live keynote. Uh, I was providing commentary on Twig while watching it. There was a ton. Obviously, some of it does not apply to this particular show. But if you're not aware, there are new Pixel phones that are half the price of the current ones and still have all the good photo qualities, etc. Once However, a guy, once a phone guy, always a phone guy. Kevin. Yeah, it's in my blood. It's in my blood. But for our purposes, there are at least three or four key aspects I just want to bring up today. And I want to emphasize how privacy and security was completely the underlying message at Google IO for the keynote. And that's, that's obviously important to our listeners for all of their connected devices. So in that regard, Google demonstrated and discussed how they're doing on-device natural language processing. This is mainly taking place on the phones today. Google said they've basically compressed like uh, a language down from the learning model, rather from like a hundred gigabytes down to a half a gig, which fits on a phone, obviously. And what that does is it 
brings privacy when you're speaking to devices that have on-device NLP. I presume this will be coming to the Google Home products in the in the near future, but it's for phones right now. It protects your privacy because the things you say don't go up to the cloud. It's all happening on device because the learning model is already there. So that is important. Additionally, Google is talking about their next generation assistant. And of course, in the homes, people who have Google Home products, that's very relevant. Partly the discussion again was around on device processing, but also what they're doing with the assistant. Remember last year they had duplex where they, um, I do they could, remember that. Yeah. You could, you could have the assistant make reservations, which you can do that now. It took about a year to roll out, et cetera, but it's here. And they, actually just a quick interlude here. Yeah. I didn't realize this duplex, like full duplex conversations basically mean a conversation where I as a person can say something and then another person responds. So it's a, it's an actual back and forth. So I had no idea that's where the name duplex came from. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I thought about it from like modems. We used to have. Um, yes. I don't know why I didn't make that connection. Yeah. That's okay. Back to the 80s, everyone. Anyway, um, so they're bringing duplex to the web. And they showed off how you can book a car for your next trip. For example, you're on a trip. Google knows you're on a trip because you probably have emails saying that, right? Yes. Google knows where I'm staying at night, how I'm getting there, when I'm getting there. Yes. So what you could do in the demo anyway, they showed off, you could say, hey, G, book a car with National for my next trip. And instead of going through all the steps in the on the web or in a national app, the assistant pre-fills in all of the information based on where you are, when you're going to need a car, what car you might have enjoyed using last time, et cetera, because it has that information. So it can pre-fill everything in and it can say, okay, I've got your car booked. Do you want to pick a class? You chose this class last time, you know, and literally make the reservation happen for you in a sense. That's really cool. It'll be even cooler if I can say book the cheapest car and it can go find the best rates. I would not surprise me if it could do that. So I always want more, Kevin. I always want more. Yes. Also, they showed more contextual things, which I kind of thought Google's actually pretty good at already. So I'm not even going to dwell on that. However, because again, Google has this information later this summer, you're going to see on smart displays a new feature called picks for you, not pictures for you, but picks such as suggestions of recipes, events, and podcasts, which is fantastic because podcast discovery is a huge challenge in my opinion. Yes. Why aren't more people listening to us? Okay. Well, I didn't go there, but yes. I am just all yes. over the place today. All That's right. Okay. And then we got gesture controls. Gesture controls in the home. And I wrote a post about this not that long ago saying, you know, voice isn't all that when it comes to the home, because there are times you want to do things without waking somebody up or shouting to a speaker. And on the new Google Nest Hub Max, which we'll talk about shortly, which is their next smart display. It has a camera and that camera has face match, meaning if you allow it to recognize faces, you have to train it. When people walk past it in your house, they will see their calendar and information pop up, which is rather interesting. But from a gesture standpoint, when it's playing music or something like that, maybe your phone rings, you want it to stop. You don't have to shout out, hey, stop. Instead, you can just wave your hand or put a talk to the hand gesture out there and it will stop playing. Oh, I kind of wanted to do that automatically, but that's just me. Yes. I know with yeah. with You Know Me, once it discovered my devices, mm -hmm. it actually automatically, whenever my phone would ring, it would stop all my Sonos players. Mm -hmm. It was kind of cool, but it did kind of, I had to take my daughter's Sonos out because she got really mad when my phone would ring and her music in her room would stop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> However. One last thing I think I'd go nuts me. about. And it's the privacy implication again. What Google is doing is it is switching the learning models for language and switching them to the edge. So what happens now or will happen, the learning model will happen on your phone or your Google Assistant device and only the model itself will go back up to the cloud to make everyone's model better. So your data is going to stay local. You won't be sending it to the cloud. You'll just be sending the model information. Excellent. And going back to your on-device natural language processing, this is something I wrote about in last week's newsletter. I talked about with something like this and a microphone, people could actually build voice controlled devices that aren't connected to the cloud. Exactly. Now, this will only work for less sophisticated things. Like you're obviously not going to go, 
here we go, full duplex with something that isn't cloud connected. But there are lots of things where you could actually have a functioning NLP model plus a sense of the commands available to the device. And it would make a lot of sense not to connect it. So a washing mm-hmm. machine is one of my favorite examples because they're a little complicated. You're like, I've got a bunch of sweaters or jeans. And if you could just tell it, um, I'm washing a load of jeans, it could actually pick the settings for you. And, without and the cloud connection. Yeah, without the cloud connection. And that seems like a really good use case of reducing the intellectual load for the person and also enabling a computer in voice control to make it easy to do something kind yes. of complex. And, and I get the sense from Google I.O. that that's where they're heading with all of this, which is wonderful because today everything has to be connected for Google Home. If you don't have an internet connection, Google Home is useless, as are other products, similar so products such as Madame A. Then you have to wonder, though, Google's big revenue is its ad business. So where does, and and we don't need to answer this today because I don't think we're going to, but my overarching question for Google is going to be, I know that they're using data to build better products. I think that's what Sundar said. But at some point in time, if you're not advertising, what are you doing? And it it makes sense in a, in a world where computing's everywhere and you don't have screens everywhere, you do have to flip your model a little bit. So just keep that in mind. (laughs) So essentially all the, Home products are going to get better in one way, and yet they're going to get worse in another. So Google has killed its Works with Nest program, or rather, it is killing it. After June 25th, you'll be asked to migrate your Nest accounts, and it sounds like your Google Wi-Fi accounts, into the Google Home. Is it Google Home or Google Assistant? Yes, because it's kind of, there's there's a lot of... (laughs) Duplicity there. Duplicity? That's lying. Don't you oh, just mean... There's a lot uh, of duplication there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long week, long day already. I'm like, really? We're, we're, I don't think they're lying. They're telling us what they're going to do. Okay. So you're basically... And in some ways, this makes sense. So what's happening is they're killing their works with Nest program. You will be asked to migrate your Nest account, your Google Wi-Fi account, all of this into one Google Home, Google Assistant account. And the reason they're doing this is because they're changing the way the Nest devices work. Historically, developers have been able to use APIs to call for information from Nest devices. So like, I might have my Hue light bulbs talk to Nest to say, is Stacy home or away right now? And if I'm away, it will actually change my lighting to on because I'm away. And it's nice. It makes my house look more lived in and secure, even if I'm on vacation. So that is going to change. No longer will devices be able to grab data from Nest devices. So if you are another smart home company or a service such as Ift or You Know Me, et cetera, you will now have to go through Google Home to talk to Nest devices, and you won't be able to get data from them. So instead of, I look at it like in the older ecosystem, all of my Nest devices and my Google devices, they work together through formal integrations that I did. And my Nest devices worked with all these other devices through formal integrations. And basically, every device had a brain, and many of them could talk to each other. What's going to happen is all of my Nest devices are basically losing their brain and ability to talk to people. They're only going to talk to Google. And the implications of this are, if you have Nest devices, those integrations will break as of the end of August. And that means if you've got Nest thermostats that talk to Ift or Madam A or any of that, all of that goes away. Some of them will be reinstated, but not all of them. And Google actually had been very considered about how it used its API. So it actually limited the API calls on Nest devices. It wouldn't actually give you video from Nest devices to other video capable screens unless they were Google screens. So some of this, we've been moving towards this, but there's a bunch of implications here for consumers. So let's talk about them. One is every smart home now needs a hub. That's the model we have clearly moved to. So in Google's world, it wants it to be the Google Home. In Amazon's world, it wants it to be Madam A. The funny thing is, we this is kind of a reverse. I mean, for the past, I'd say, year, I've kind of been giving up on hubs and saying, you know what? I want a hub, but I guess the market doesn't. Now the market's not going to have a choice, at least when it comes to Google. Right. 
So this begs the question of, hey, what happens to companies that have acted as like virtual hubs or physical hubs? So like a smart things, wink, you know me, et cetera. I look at this like smart things will probably now go talk to Nest devices through the Google Home. I see that happening, right? I think it'll be an interesting test for Wink to see how really on top of things they are, because this is going to be a development effort. You know, there's going to be a poll here that you have to make. And I don't know if Wink is going to do it. And then with a company like You Know Me, which is all virtual, I don't know how this affects them. I Mm -hmm. am very eager to talk to them. I've sent out some emails. And with Ift, Ift says that it will not hurt it at all. Rishi Chandra who is the head of hardware over at Google, he actually spoke to a colleague of ours, Yanko at Variety, and he basically said, this kills Lyft. He didn't basically say it. He said, it will break Ift. Yep. So that's not great news for Ift. Uh, or people who really rely on Ift. I mean, there's going to be a lot of upset people if they haven't heard this news already. Yes. So you're like, oh my gosh, I love my smart home. What should I do? Well, The scorched earth perspective is dump all your nest gear and kick Google to the curb. But this is going to be happening everywhere because what's happening is your hardware devices are providing valuable data. They're also providing that data to other places and it's become too hard for a company to control. So along with this announcement, Google has actually put out really good guidelines for what sensors are in its devices, how those sensors are used, and how the data from those sensors are used. That's not something it could do if it was actually sending this out to third parties. So in some ways, this taking back of control benefits you as a, as a user for the perspective of understanding who has your data and when. Now, as a consumer, I sort of hate it. I get why it's happening, but I do hate the fact that now all my Nest devices are captive. They're no longer like I don't know if they're going to work and Google's going to do a, a Madam A integration, right? Nest had one. Will Google? No idea. So that could be a problem. The other thing is there are plenty of smart thermostats out there in the world. There are plenty of security systems out there in the world. And it may be that if you go all in on Google, you get this seamless Apple-like experience, right? And a lot of people like that, and they don't mind being in that limited ecosystem. So they will keep that. I imagine a lot of our listeners will probably steer closer to another device. Maybe it's the Ecobee thermostat that is really awesome. Maybe they do something with Honeywell, who works with both Google and Madam A and Siri. So there are still options. If you want to have that multi-device household, you're going to have to go independent and you're going to have to work a little harder at it. Yeah, that's the downside. I mean, this makes things more difficult in the decision making and setup process or planning process. It's going back to a siloed model, which Apple already has pretty much a siloed model. And now it looks like Google's going that way. And yet they don't truly have like a multi-radio hub. And one thing that was not announced was that next gen Google Wi-Fi product all in one with the mesh networking and potentially as a hub that I had been talked about before, uh, Mistral, that device is still in the works. So is there a Google Home true hub coming? I don't know. Yeah, me either. So that's pretty much all we have time for, but we'll, we'll probably keep talking about this as more information comes out and more vendors yeah. are. And in a lot of, you're going to see in your home a lot of emails over the next few days telling you that this particular device is going to change its functionality. We didn't even get into like the idea of like how device functionality changes, but we'll do that mm-hmm. later. I'll write an essay. Before okay. We, before we get away from Google IO, I just want to spend 30 seconds and mention that Google Nest Hub Max, which is a new product. It's a 10 inch smart display. Very, it's identical to the smaller, what used to be called Google Home Hub. It's now called the Nest Hub. This has one woofer and two tweeters for better sound. It's got a camera, which you can turn off electronically, not with a shutter. And that camera can be used like a Nest Cam to monitor the room around it. Uh, So it's got a security feature as well, which the original Google Home Hub does not. Yes. I should probably dig into the Google privacy policies too. Okay. Yes. Look for my newsletter. It's going to be full of exciting things. All right. Moving along. 
not very far, just to the next digital assistant over, Madam A, Amazon's digital assistant, who we call Madam A because we don't want to set everyone's off. Jeff Fowler over at the Washington Post did a wonderful deep dive on his Madam A utterances. These are the things you say or every time that Madam A wakes up and says, yes, it starts recording. So he went and listened to all of his recordings over the years of living with Madam A. And what he found is a lot of totally normal interactions where he's like, turn on the lights, play this song set a timer. But he also found a lot of times where it was mistakenly activated and lots of fragments of conversations that should have never been recorded, much less been sent up to the cloud for processing. So people read this and he said he is actually dumping his Amazon Echo and his Google devices. And he's like, yep, I'm done. Not doing it. I know this is how she works. And I went through and I actually on my Google device changed the way it works because you can go in on your Google devices and pause the recordings. So it won't actually record your utterances when you say something like, hey, G. Now, that means it won't get better. So that is the trade-off you're making there. However, I was like, yeah, I'll make that trade-off. That's cool. On Madam A, there's not an option for that. So I don't know. What do you think, Kevin? I'm like, should I dump Madam A? I mean, I know this is happening, but... Yeah, it's a very personal choice, so I can't make a blanket statement telling people what to do. I think you have the right approach. You have a good understanding of what it saves, what it sends to the cloud, and you're making that choice, you know, between convenience and privacy. I don't use a Madam A. My house is outfitted with Google products because I just prefer those products and the way they work. It has nothing to do with the privacy. So... I don't know. I mean, this is not something, I mean, I don't think anybody should be terribly surprised by this. I mean, everybody's been saying for years, putting a microphone and or cameras in your house leads to privacy challenges. And well, yeah, uh, but if that's the kind of environment you want to live in where you have the convenience of the features that these bring, then you're going to have to live with those privacy implications. Right. And as part of that, or maybe it was totally independent, over at Axios, Ina Fried, who is excellent at her job, said or did an article on what Amazon knows about you. And it's pretty astonishing. I mean, it's a long list. It's not astonishing, you know, if you recognize you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, Amazon bought Whole Foods. It knows what I buy at Whole Foods. Oh, yeah, it knows what I watch on Prime Video. Or what? how many books I've read on my Kindle, including for me, my library books, because I get a lot of library books through my Kindle. And then with Key, Amazon Go, it knows what you're buying at the stores. And it was it was a pretty good overview. So I'm going to link to that so you can have a more educated decision. I didn't really talk about Amazon's credit cards with Chase Bank, but I have one of those along with many other people. And Mm. I think it knows quite a bit about that, too. Ina also has um, links at the bottom of that with similar articles about what Google knows about you, Facebook, Tesla, etc. And they're also well worth the read. Yes. All right. Here's some little Amazon product news. Amazon has deepened its Madam A ring integration with person detection alerts. About time. Yeah. So this is a new feature you can find in the settings for your ring camera. Just enable person detection. And I assume it works similar to like the Nest Hello person detection that we have. I hope so. That gives you better notifications. It tells you who's at your door or in the notification. It's like, Kevin arrived home. You're like, great. I don't even have to open that. I just need to know Kevin arrived. Amazon is also announcing the new Blink X-T2 camera. This is a battery-powered camera. Amazon bought Blink two years ago. Blink had been a chip company that had a really cool image processing chip that was very low power. And... That didn't sell very well, or it didn't sell at high enough margins for them. So they decided they were going to make a camera, and they sold the camera. And this worked really well, and Amazon bought it. So they got a camera company, but they also got a really cool silicon provider as part of that. Just a little background on Blink. Uh, The Blink X-T2 is an indoor-outdoor battery-powered 1080p HD video camera with two-way audio. It's going to be 90 bucks with free cloud storage and no monthly fees. I will say we get a lot of requests for a wireless outdoor camera. This fits it. It does. I'm amazed at the battery life they claim. Two AA batteries would last up to two years of battery life. That is the magical power of optimized silicon, my friends. Yep. So 
I'm going to get one of these because why not? It's a wireless outdoor camera and $90. I mean, is that wise cam cheap? No, but it's not crazy. It's much less than the Arlo's. So, okay. Moving on to the next big tech conference, Microsoft Build, also happening this week, and a lot of stuff on the industrial side. So things we should know, Windows 10 IoT, they actually are making it a lot easier to get your old, I don't want to call it industrial, but your old stuff that's running older versions of Windows, like Windows CE, over to Windows IoT, Windows 10 IoT. So That migration was really important because there's tons of old stuff out there that is susceptible to all kinds of security flaws that we just need to kill. But you can't kill something that you spent a million dollars on. It runs like some highly proprietary process. But now you can migrate it. Yay! Microsoft also announced, or rolled out rather, its AI and robotics toolkit in a limited preview for Windows 10. So you can basically build robots and intelligent software agents using Microsoft AI and Azure tools that will run physical systems. Yay. So yeah, now basically this is the really embedded things part of the Internet of Things. And Microsoft say, here's ways to get them running a modern, secure operating system that will conveniently tie back into our cloud. All right. Also at Build, Twilio announced that they will have some of their IoT SIM cards will tie in very easily to Microsoft Azure IoT. It's going to be part of Microsoft's IoT plug and play connectivity effort. In Microsoft, way, way, way back in the day when you actually connected your printer and your keyboards and stuff to your computer, they had a plug and play program that made it so you didn't have to download drivers. Microsoft worked with all these device manufacturers and they were like, we're going to build everything we need so someone can just come in and plug in a printer to this machine and it will work. That's basically what they're doing with IoT plug and play, but they're working with manufacturers to plug devices into the Azure cloud. So similar concept, slightly different in execution. And so these are smart sims run by Twilio. I think this is going to be a big deal for people who want to plug in random connected devices. So Yay! Or or deploy large-scale devices. And deploy large-scale devices, yes. The other two things that are worth noting is Microsoft also launched better conversational skills for Cortana. And again, while Google and Amazon are very focused in the smart home, Microsoft is very focused in the enterprise. It's doing a lot of the same things with NLP on device, thinking about privacy and basically trying to figure out how to deploy conversational-based agents throughout offices. And if you think about this, this is a really great area for Microsoft to be in because Microsoft understands that, hey, you can't hold those utterances because it might be someone's like secure earnings or other data. (laughs) So enterprises are very concerned about those sorts of things. So looking for Microsoft to do a lot of cool stuff there, we're seeing a couple last year, actually, I was at Build and I saw a really awesome demo where basically this device in the middle of a table at a meeting took notes, flagged action items, and then sent reports out to everyone who was at the meeting. Mm. This is the kind of technology that gets us to that. It was very compelling. So yay, looking forward to that. And then the one that everyone was talking about on Twitter was a demonstration of recommendation engines deployed at drive throughs for Starbucks. It was very cool. I'm not going to go into that because, you know, Microsoft just bought a company that does the same thing. I fully expect recommendations to come everywhere. I interact with anything. But what was cool about the Starbucks demo, one, they're putting IoT in all sorts of Starbucks gear for like predictive maintenance and making sure everything's running well in the physical stores. But also they're using Azure Sphere to do it. And Azure Sphere grew from Microsoft's Project Sopris a couple years ago. And this is Microsoft's way of securing the IoT. It involves a secure chip that talks to the cloud and gets data from the cloud and is certified as being what it's supposed to be. And all of the information passing between the device and the cloud is encrypted. And it's in the cloud checking for vulnerabilities as they come up and then letting and updating the chip and letting the manufacturer know. So this is kind of like an ongoing physical to cloud security solution that Microsoft has talked about for a while, but I haven't actually seen anyone using it. But now I have. Now you have. 
And that's good because for a while, when they announced it, a lot of people were very skeptical. They were like, yeah, I don't think this is really ready yet. And now it is. Okay. Few other stories to get to. Bluetooth. The Bluetooth SIG, special interest group, has released a report. We'll link to it in the show notes. But basically, it's telling us that there is a lot of Bluetooth out there. For example, there are now 34,465 Bluetooth SIG members. That is a 70% growth rate in the last five years, which is a lot. In 2018, there are now 3.7 billion Bluetooth devices shipped, a number they expect to grow to 5.4 billion by 2023. That's per year. That's, yes. Well, that's, that's not cumulative. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a lot of silicon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of really good information in here. Like, hey, of those shipments, how many are for audio streaming versus just straight up sensors and health and wellness and others. So we'll dig into that a little bit more in the newsletter and you can read the report from the links in the show notes. Okay. And an update to a story we talked about last week, we talked about tenants in a New York apartment building suing their landlord who wanted to put latch connected locks in the building. And that case is now settled. So the results of the settlement are that the tenants get physical keys if they want them. They argued that there are privacy issues at play, etc. The downside is this is a settlement. This isn't any sort of legal decision. So there's no precedent being set here, really, except for other people could sue and point to this settlement, I guess. But this is bad news for Latch, or maybe it's bad news for landlords who want to cheap out and buy only electronic systems without physical keys, because Latch actually does offer a physical keys. And so in the settlement, the judge said that, hey, physical keys are a required service for landlords. So a smart entry system is not considered a required service. So if the landlord doesn't provide physical keys, the tenants could bring this to court again. So keep that in mind, you guys, if you're getting a smart lock system in your apartment building and you don't want to give up your physical key. Yeah. And it's not just the privacy that people are concerned with and one particular person in the in the case is 93 years old, says he's not capable of using a phone, and he found himself trapped in his home because of the smart locks. Yep, that's the sort of thing people love to read about. Yep. <laughs> All right. And now it is time for the Internet of Things podcast hotline. This week's hotline is brought to you by Schlage. Schlage's wide variety of smart locks lets you create the smart home of your dreams. You can learn more about Schlage's smart home solutions and compatibility with Amazon and Apple products, plus Google Assistant, and more at schlage.com slash IoT. We're not going to be playing a voicemail because we got several voicemails asking us about the Wise Sense system. And this is a kit of sensors made by Wise that works with the Wise camera. And I've been testing this in my apartment, actually, for the last few weeks. And it's time for me to tell you what I think. First up, the Wise Sense package is $20. You, for that price, get a bridge. You get two open-close sensors and one motion sensor. All of these work with a Wise camera. The bridge plugs into the back of the Wise cameras. So basically what you're looking at is for 40 to 50 bucks, you get this like little itty bitty bitty security system. <laughs> it is not monitored. So keep that in mind. But it is a really convenient way to set up. I don't know if we should call it security. Maybe we should just call it informational. I mean, it's nice. Yeah. It's nice to know when people are coming and going in my house. So I set this up in about 15 minutes. I plugged in the camera, I plugged the bridge in, I set everything up. I've got a comprehensive review on the site. The bridge goes into the actual camera. It does. So Kevin, even, this is a bridge you would not mind. Exactly. Because it's not another box sitting somewhere on a table. And I pointed my camera at the front door of my apartment and I stuck the open close sensor on there and every time and I set it up. So every time that door opens, it records a snippet of video and it works. I don't know how else I've used it actually since I'm traveling. I've used it to check on my dog who spends all day by the front door waiting for people to come home. It's kind of sad, you guys. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It's it's really sad to watch. And I set another sensor. I set it up on the back door and then I set up a motion sensor 
at the back window because we've got paint. It it looks over the balcony that we have and we've got painters on the balcony. So I kind of just wanted to to kind of keep an eye on them. For that setup, though, I would need another camera. Or I guess I would need the pan cam to go pan where the motion was. Mm. I don't know if it actually does that because I don't have a pan cam to test. Nuts. Okay. It works. I don't know how else to say the latency is incredibly low. These are sensors that only work with Wise. They're on a totally proprietary sub gigahertz frequency, but they're small. I cannot emphasize to you guys how small these sensors are. They are less than an inch. It is crazy to me. Mm-hmm. Having worked with these like two inch tall motion sensors, this is nuts. Also crazy is the price, what you're getting for your 20 bucks. Oh, yeah. You know. Granted, you have to have a twenty dollars wise cam, so okay, so it's forty bucks to really use it. But still, to get a camera, motion sensor, two open close sensors, and have that kind of functionality for literally forty bucks, if you have not, no wise products now, that is crazy cheap because just one motion sensor can easily cost you twenty bucks, if not more. Oh yeah, and this is quality gear. I obviously have not been testing it for a year or longer, so I can't tell you how the battery life is going to work. But I can tell you that it comes with the tape already on the back, so you don't have to mess with that. Having tested dozens of these sorts of devices over the last few years, this is easily up there in build quality. This is lovely. The other thing that people who are privacy focused might want to know about is Wise lets you record everything to an SD card on the camera. And that's what I do with mine. Yes. But you don't have to have the SD card. If you do the event based recording, it will go to the cloud. So you need to know that. And they use encryption on the device. They have two factor authentication, which we love because, you know, two factor is the way to go. And yeah, if, I mean, heck, I'd get this just to play with it, but. It's also a great gift. Graduation is coming up. Your your kids are going to be moving to college or moving to apartments. And something like this is a really nice way to give them a little bit of peace of mind. Okay, so this show has been crazy long, but it's going longer still. Please stay tuned for our guest, Kiva Allgood, who is the brand new head of IoT and automotive at Ericsson. We're going to be talking about... <gasps> 5G. We're also going to be talking about why the industrial internet of things has not gotten the adoption it deserves and a lot more. So stay tuned for her and for our message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Dell Technologies. Hey, everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Dell Technologies. And we are here with Basque Iyer, who is CIO of VMware and General Manager for Edge and IoT at Dell Technologies. Basque, you'll be keynoting next week at IoT World. And one of the big themes at the event is how organizations can learn to be digital organizations. Do you have any insights to offer our audience on that? Yeah, digital is not just technology. It's about people, process, and technology. And we found that, you know, this is the time to hire good talent, people who actually understand digital, who actually understand real time, who, who know your business, etc. You cannot just outsource this. And we're going to talk about process. We're going to steal a few things from the world of software development and introduce the concept of agile, not just for software development, but the whole company has to work agile. And then obviously technology has a big play So it's not just technology, but ecosystem. So we'll talk about people, process, and technology, and culture. The culture is a culture of innovation, culture of doing something, trying out, and if it fails, come back very quickly. Culture is going to be very important in this world of moving to digital as well. And I understand you're going to be bringing a case study along with you. Can you tell me more about that? Sure. This is going to be exciting. We're going to bring an actual case study We're going to showcase the city of Las Vegas, how they are trying to improve efficiency and safety and drive innovation, obviously with VMware and Dell Technologies and our partner, NTT, and how we create an ecosystem of large-scale IoT and edge solutions. So Dell Technologies is working with a lot of companies and building ecosystems around IoT. So where does Dell Technologies and VMware play in that? When should folks call you? We actually believe that we want to encourage these ecosystems. You know, we don't believe one player can dominate or should dominate this whole space. IoT and Edge is very big. It's going to benefit all of human society worldwide. And so we strongly believe that we need an ecosystem, and we are committed towards building that ecosystem. We have shown that before. VMware is well-known 
to promote multiple ecosystems, multiple partners, multiple storage vendors, multiple drive clouds, etc. We call ourselves the multi-cloud, multi-application, multi-device company. So that's why ecosystem is important. And quite honestly, the people we're going to be working in IoT and Edge are people who are not familiar to IT, but very, very familiar to this OT. People such as Honeywell, Siemens, and SI such as NTT, Emerson, Philips, and, and Alan Bradley, and so on and so on and so on. So we need to enable an ecosystem for all IT players, all OT players, and all system integrators so we can provide what is right for the customers. Excellent. So where can we go to learn more about Dell Technologies? Well, you could come to delltechnologies.com backslash IoT, and we'll have a lot of information. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is Kiva Allgood, who is the head of IoT and automotive at Ericsson. Hi, Kiva. How are you? I'm great, Stacey. How are you? Excellent. All right. So you recently joined Ericsson from GE, and you are in charge of all their IoT efforts now. So let's talk about how you look at the IoT. Yes, all things IoT and automotive. So, you know, anything that's not a handset, I'm super excited to be part of the Ericsson family and team. And from my point of view, IoT is a slightly overused word, Internet of Things or Industrial Internet. The reality is it's the platform of the future is the way I look at it. So all the transformation that we've seen over the last 10 years of connecting people via phone, so you no longer are attached to the wall, you can go anywhere globally. And that really means everything. So if you think about transitioning from a analog world to a digital world, that's happening in your car, that's happening in your appliances, that's happening on the industrial plant floor, that's happening on thermostats, elevators, you think about anything we start to touch, it is being transformed by connectivity. And so from my point of view, it's a, it's a perfect place to be because they're going to be driving the forefront of that change. I agree with you, actually. I am very much that IoT is a platform, kind of like broadband was, kind of like the mobile internet was. Having everything be connected and having data streams from all of them is going to enable entirely new ecosystems, services. It's going to be awesome. But we're not there yet. So let's talk about, you've worked at Qualcomm, which is on the chip side, doing building the actual infrastructure. You've worked at GE, which is very applied. Now you're on the kind of networking side at Ericsson. So given that you have this wide-ranging view of what we need to make IoT possible, let's run through some of the big challenges. A lot of people talk about there being like a billion connected devices, which feels like a lot. But even if we want to get to, you know, 100 million or 500 million, we're still dealing with some basic challenges of scale. Which ones are you thinking about? Yeah, I think in the end, in order for that Internet of Things to become truly that platform that people can design, develop, create ecosystems, become the next millionaire off of, we are going to need to strive for really interoperability. And interoperability will drive scalability, which will equal profitability. Without the combination of those two things, it's really difficult to get to that profitability space. I also think one of the key things that is pulling thing holding, I would say, it isn't technology, it's human behavior. So if you think about where we're starting to connect things, it's on a plant floor. Well, the factory already exists. There's been billions of dollars spent to build that factory. Now we're going to retrofit it and connect it wirelessly with 5G because you can. The latency and the performance is the same as if it was wired. Plus, you'd get a whole bunch of other productivity because you could rework the, the factory floor in a day. But a plant manager is going to be resistant to that because they're so used to kind of the way things are and the way the factory is laid out today to tell them they could reconfigure their floor in a day, they would be no way because they're the ones responsible for the output. Plus, there's a lot of systems and things designed in, in that specific example, that industrial example, that would have to also be flexible. You have to keep your OSHA ratings. You have to have documentation how things work to keep your ISO certification. Where in the wireless space, we were just replacing a phone on the wall and putting it in your pocket, and then it became a supercomputer. And you had standards bodies like the 3GPP and others that were working collectively together 
order to bring those things to market. We have to start to see that in the Internet of Things. And there's a lot of work being done on 3GPP and other standards bodies, but now they have to find their way into other forms and other places that people work. So that's like the National Association for Water Utilities, NARU, or the Electrical Certification Consortium. So you've got all of these standards and standards bodies that also have to be influenced to understand the value that wireless connectivity can bring and that IoT can bring. And I was this year at Hanover, I'll tell you a personal story, the 5G was at the forefront. And so here you've got this historic event that I've had the pleasure of being an attendee at over probably the last six years. And connectivity was a component of it, but it wasn't at the forefront of the show. And this year it really was. So I think we're starting, we're at the tip of that transition where the people's behavior and recognizing that you can do it differently is going to start to change people's behavior. It's going to start to change procurement practices, but you have to get to interoperability to get to scalability, to get to profitability in the IoT space. And that means people are going to have to change the behavior. The technology is finally there. It's available. So it's not a technical issue. It's a people performance and positioning issue, in my opinion. Okay. I also agree with you on the standard side. And I would say what is interesting about IoT, and there are parallels, is that this is something that's going to be adopted unevenly across different industries. And We don't actually have base technical standards yet, which I think are really important for getting things at the network layer to talk to each other, standards around security, maybe even interoperability around certain types of devices. But I also think we're going to have them at the industry level. And I'm curious if you think the industry is going to adopt standards around IoT faster than maybe they did around mobile or even broadband? I would hope so. I mean, I I think to your point, if we do a double click just on battery life, to me, that's not a technical issue as far as it can't be solved. And that's how I think about it's a matter of a lot of times we don't understand the use case well enough. So I'll give a good example of a water project in Australia where a company was spending millions of dollars sending people out, techs out to measure lakes because they had to for a commitment to build a building. And in part because they felt like they couldn't use wireless for some reason, even though it was actually fully covered. And it was because the people who had tried to sell them a product, it was sending a signal every 15 seconds. Well, they only sent a person out there once a month to measure the depth of the lake. So you could put in software that would say, hey, if the lake went above or below this, then send a signal, send a report. And that took the battery life from basically a week to five years. So I think you have to really, really, really understand how the technology is going to be applied, and then figure it out. I think there's been a lot of, I would say, false, oh, that'll never work, because people haven't taken the time to really understand the technical application or the use cases that are required. Okay. And that gets to this idea of resilience, which in the cellular world, in the industrial world, these are systems that are made to be resilient. They have backups, they have, you know, five nines is not uncommon, even more nines is even better. When we get to the tech world, that's not always the case. We are getting much better, but you know, it's it's only been a few years since, you know, Twitter would go down all the time. You know, it's I can't do this. Facebook was just down a couple weeks ago. How do we bring the innovation and the kind of flexibility associated with the tech world and meld that with the resilience and redundancy needed by the, the industrial world as we as we kind of mesh these two things together? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think it's one that also causes people to shrivel a little bit because they have those user experiences with the tech world on a daily basis, right? And so also from security breaches. So you brought up security, which is also, it could be a technical gap to the point of is good enough. If someone can hack their way into a factory and shut it down for the day, then, you know, again, the impact of that is more than someone losing their phone for half a day. So I think it goes in both directions. And I think that's actually a unique opportunity for Ericsson because Ericsson 
strives for more than five nines and understands what it means to stand up a network. And I think as we move into the IoT space, we're doing it with that framework in mind. Now, I'd say to date, that hasn't necessarily been the case for some other folks because they've definitely said, oh, we'll just stand up a network. What they don't realize is it's really, really difficult to keep a network up and redundant and performing all of the time. And that's what's going to be required in order for us to move and really make the reality of IoT happen and profitable. And I think that now we're at a point where the network is finally, and with 5G, where we'll be able to provide that for these very specific use cases. And you'll start to see the products and the services stand up around those. Not everything's going to be in the cloud. I think you're going to see a lot more edge compute. Because if you think about what does an industrial player have on the floor today, they have a computer usually. Sometimes they have internet access, but not always, because that, that can be a threat. So, so I, I'm confident you'll end up with edge services and IT and OT will get married and they will both be resilient. Excellent. Okay. And you keep bringing it up. So let's talk about 5G. What industries do you see adopting 5G first? Will it be like consumers? Will it be factories? Will it be cars? Well, obviously, with our carrier partners, the faster that they're able to deploy a network, it's going to be a lower cost per gigabyte than the current 4G. So there's a huge incentive there, even for the consumer base. So I strongly believe that it's going to be a transition for the carrier partners and then for their customers. So the faster we can drive that, the quicker that ecosystem will continue to evolve. After the carrier market and consumers, I do believe that it's going to be industrial and automotive for sure, because those are two use cases where 5G creates a competitive advantage. They're not as cost sensitive. When you're throwing off terabytes of data off a vehicle, it has to be real time and it has to be reliable. 5G is the best way to do that. Same thing for the industrial use cases as well. Let's dig into the industrial use cases because factory floors are horrible environments for any RF. <laughs> I love the factory floors. One of my favorite Sorry, I places. Should, I should say that they're, they're horrible for RF. <laughs> So if we're talking about deploying 5G in these situations, especially with at some of the higher frequency spectrum, how does that work? What will that end up looking like? And, and what are the big gains that the factory floor will get from deploying basically 5G? Yeah, again, you get the low latency, you get the high throughput, the higher performance, and it really does enable to the point where you can cut the cord. And, you know, my view and my vision is, especially when you start to look at the, the transformation that's occurring in a manufacturing environment, you know, now every, everybody wants something customized, right? They want this specialized 3D printed thing for themselves. They want their Uggs with this matched with that, or they want their Invisalign or plastics. So you're starting to get to an economy of one, which means manufacturing now has to be more specialized. If you could reconfigure the factory floor and pull and play and place different things based off of what was ordered every hour versus every month, that gives you a ton of flexibility. Now, 5G, if you're able to do that wirelessly at the same output and same reliability and same security as if you had everything connected, then that's a huge, that's a leapfrog. That's a big step forward. And we're at that point now with partners like ABB and others where we've demonstrated the fact that you can get that same performance where you haven't been able to with other technologies. And I know from my past experience that we use technologies that on paper, that based on science, if you were to put this radio inside of a windmill, you wouldn't have interference. But once you did, and then the windmill started turning, and then the generator started working, and the noise that was actually created inside of this giant thing, it didn't work the way you wanted it to, and you didn't get the reliability. I think now you're finally at a point where the radio and the connectivity and the connection is going to be able to provide the same type of experience, even sometimes better, because you don't have the issue of rats or people tripping or something cutting. You, you actually get a ton more flexibility as the current Ethernet does. Yeah, and I think the flexibility is a really interesting use cases. I haven't thought about rats, but sure, rats also. But when you have programmable machines and when you start seeing more AI on the factory floors, you can actually start moving your equipment around and reprogramming it as it were, in a way that I don't think you could do with a wired system. So I've talked to ABB and a couple other companies about that sort of thing, and it's, it's pretty exciting. 
It is transformational, especially too, if you start to think about, yeah, the 3D printing space that really gives you the flexibility long term to, to have multiple different lines and it allows a lot of, I'd say, ingenuity to start to find its way into a factory floor, which I think is kind of the, that next frontier. It's really going to be the platform of the future. It's just going to be redefined with the gig economy and a lot of other things coming coming forward. Plus, I'd say on that note, it's a lot more interesting if, if you're trying to find people to work on a factory floor, um, if it is more of a robot and it, and it looks more like a phone, you're going to be able to hire those folks and train those folks a lot more effectively and efficiently. So I have been talking with Ericsson for probably the last five or six years about IoT. The company has really been very forward-looking in building out services and ecosystems in this space. So I'm, I'm curious, are we there yet? I feel like we started talking about it and things were, we were all excited and then things hit a plateau where people were doing pilot projects, but nothing really happened. So do you see us kind of accelerating with IoT? Or are we still kind of at this place where we're like, eh, we're going to do a lot of talk and not a lot of action? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I've been here for coming up on a month. My focus is action for sure. So, you know, what I love to do is take a company from, you know, a couple hundred million to a billion. And I have faith that the core capabilities are here. The core products are here. We're getting a lot of traction with the carrier partners and they're getting a lot of pool from industrial and enterprise partners on wanting to do things differently. Sometimes it starts with a, like you mentioned, a proof of concept, but we're really, we've got 32 partners in the ecosystem around the industrial space. And we've had a ton of success with regard to our connectivity manager product and our device management product, as well as our connectivity management product. So we're scaling as quickly as we possibly can. I think now it's a matter of can we scale as quickly as the market would like us to. And I think um, that's where our focus will really be on. And what are those use cases where we can create the most value? And where uh, are those partnerships and partners? I think that's one key thing that the internet did so well, is it allowed multiple players to win and be successful. Now we're transitioning what I would say is a very traditional closed loop system. So if you think about kind of players in oil and gas or even in manufacturing floor, they sold the hardware, they sold the software, and then they never let anybody else in. Now we actually have to really think about that transition as well. And we have to find the right partners that will help us bring our products and solutions to market as quickly as we possibly can, and we're going to have to partner faster. So I think from that perspective, it's taking our core capabilities, matching those up with the system integrators and the players in the space that understand those vertical markets. Like I I said, mentioned ABB, they know factory floors. We have a factory floor, but we don't live in a factory floor. We can connect all of those things, but we need the partners to help us get there and create that more open ecosystem that allows a lot of people to be successful, not just a certain product or entity. So I'd say that's going to be a slightly different lens. And I think we are there. Oh, good, because I've been waiting for these use cases. And oh, I have been (laughs) waiting for years. All right, Kiva, thanks so much for coming on the show this week. You bet. Thank you for taking the time. And I appreciate it. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week.